So basically, I want to talk about two things today. Uh, one is uh, Decassette's new uh, supercomputer and especially the storage system. And the second part will be a bit about cost efficiency, uh, especially stuff we're doing regarding compression um, inside of Lustre, basically. So uh, a few brief words about who we are, because we're kind of new in this whole Lustre scene. Um, we're called Scientific Computing. We're a, a university research group located in the German Climate Computing Center, uh, the building here on the right. Um, the, the situation is a bit special because our boss is both a, a computer science professor at the university and the head uh, or director of the set. And uh, what we do is basically <laughs> everything that has to do with HPC and um, high performance I.O. Uh, we deal with tracing tools, middleware optimizations, uh, interfaces, and uh, also cost and energy efficiency, um, as you will see in the second part. And uh, you've heard in Andreas' talk probably, we're an Intel Parallel Computing Center for Lustre, uh, and we're dealing with this, this enhanced adaptive compression uh, in Lustre. Okay. So first part, a bit about Mistral, which is uh, Decarset's new supercomputer. So a lot of this information is actually not from me, but from Carsten. So if you have in-depth question about the system, he's probably the right guy to ask, uh, since I'm a university guy, not Decarset. So Mistral went into operation in two phases. Um, the, the first part was procured and, and installed in spring 2015. And the second part was just installed this year, 2016. Um, it's currently number 33 on the top 500, so it's um, kind of powerful, but it's not one of the fastest computers uh, in, in Germany even, or in Europe. Um, but the storage system is pretty nice, so that's what we will focus on. It has approximately 3,000 nodes um, from phase one and two. The phase one machines are Haswell, uh, with 12 cores and uh, second phase two or broad one machines, a bit slower but with more cores. Um, so overall it has a performance of two and a half petaflops. Uh, it uses something less than two megawatts, I'm not sure about the exact number. Um, has a 240 terabytes of RAM and FDR InfiniBand with a FAT tree and two to one blocking. So that will be important a bit later. Uh, because it basically means inside a rack you can communicate at full speed, but as soon as you leave the rack, um, not all of the nodes can communicate at full speed. Especially they cannot communicate with the Lustre servers at full speed. So, uh, storage system, the interesting part. Uh, it's a Lustre system, obviously. Uh, it has uh, 54 PB bytes. I just noticed this yesterday, so actually it's a bit more than 60 petabytes of capacity. Um, currently, I guess it would say like that, it's split into two file systems due to these phases, so it's not one large. For the users it looks like that, so it, it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's one of the larger ones, um, and that also is a problem for the cassette. We will talk about this later. Um, so from the last machine to the current one, they were able to increase the compute performance by a factor of 20, the storage throughput by a factor of 15, but the storage capacity only by a factor of 9.5. Uh, so they wanted to have a storage system of 100 petabytes upwards, but it's kind of expensive and uh, problematic. So um, that's where the compression will come into play. Uh, it's based on its Seagate cluster store. It uses the scalable um, storage units and expansion storage units um, will be important later. Uh, throughput, at least what's published, is 400 50 gigabytes per second, so not the fastest one, but one of the largest ones. Um, around 6 gigabytes per second per node, and a single stream performance of 1 gigabyte per second, so probably the same for everyone. Um, as I said, it uses the Seagate cluster store solution, so it has this nice fancy uh, web interface. Um, it's probably impossible to read, but uh, you get a nice overview here of all the nodes. Uh, you see how many disks and racks are in there, uh, you see the actual throughput here and here and the peak throughputs there. Um, so this is only for the phase one system and probably more or less in the beginning because if you could read it you would see that the throughput is only 5 gigabytes per second. Um, so there's still a lot of room left. Um, 
So how does it look like? Phase one is based on the CS9000 um, systems. It uses Lustre 2.5 based on the Seagate uh, software branch. It uses uh, a bit more than 60 OSSs, so servers, and each server has two targets. Um, so each of these uh, SSUs and ESUs is composed of two trays. They have 41 disks inside, and the old phase used six terabyte disks. And uh, each of these uh, units also has one SSD that is currently used for parity, but could also be used for burst buffering and stuff like that. So it also uses the um, distributed namespace with five metadata servers uh, for phase one. And um, a colleague of mine did a benchmark and phase the phase one system alone reaches approximately 80,000 metadata operations per second. Um, yeah. So with phase two, that's based on these L300 uh, systems, again, Lustre 2.5, Seagate version, uh, this time more than 70 object storage servers, uh, again, two targets per server, and um, an additional seven metadata servers, so in total it's now um, 12. So together with phase two, it's probably in the range of 200,000, I guess, metadata operations per second, um, so pretty fast. Uh, the only thing that changed in phase two is actually the size of the hard disks. So instead of six terabytes, now eight terabytes. And um, it uses a 2.8 rate configuration. So if you, if you want to use the numbers to compute the actual capacity, it will be a bit higher than that. Okay, the file system itself, um, apart from what I already mentioned, it's really two Lustre file systems, but the file system for users is separated into three parts, uh, home, work, and scratch. Uh, home is yeah, home directories. It has a quota per user uh, in the range of gigabytes, and it's backed regularly. Uh, the work directory is for input and output data, so there where the actual uh, climate simulations take place, and uh, their project-specific quotas are used. That is. Uh, one of the problems, so there's a mix of user quotas and project quotas, and the 2.5 version obviously does not have project quota support yet. Um, yeah, I will talk about it on the next slide. So no backups for this, uh, users are responsible for that, and then there's Scratch, uh, 15 terabyte quota per user again. Uh, no backups obviously since that is scratched, and uh, it's deleted 14 days after the data is last accessed, which means that you, you can somehow circumvent that if you really want to. Um, okay, and all these quota things and cleaning up, so the policies are done with Robin Hood. Uh, Carson also gave a talk about this on, on Monday, as far as I know. Uh, currently, it's only used for quota reporting, so um, if you accidentally uh, put your results into your home directory, you will get a nice um, nightly email by the cassette people saying, you are using uh, 200 gigabytes of your 24 gigabytes, please don't do that. Um, but currently it's not enforced. Um, I guess it's planned to enforce it at some point. And uh, it's also planned to do the scratch cleanup using Robinhood, so currently it's not done, um, but it will be. So it uses five instances of uh, Robinhood, uh, one per, currently one per metadata server in the phase one machine, since there were five metadata servers. But the plan is to keep the five instances, two for the phase one system and three for the phase two system. Uh, each of these Robin Hood servers is a separate server uh, with a few fast SSDs, um, some dedicated for the operating system and some dedicated for the database, and uh, a lot of main memory for the database. And uh, I think this started out with a much lower performance, but now they're at six million entries per hour that uh, these Robinhood instances can scan. And um, that's pretty nice because each metadata server currently holds roughly 60 million um, entries. So you could do a complete scan in 10 hours. Well, currently with the phase two system, it probably will take more than like, like a day or so, uh, but still performs pretty nice. So, uh, a few more things. Uh, there's a tape system currently with a capacity of 200 petabytes. Um, it will be upgraded, I think, to half an exabyte 
um, over the lifetime of Mistral. So Mistral will be probably replaced in 2020 or so. Uh, there's currently no automatic HSM uh, for just yeah, educational reasons, I would say, uh, because otherwise the users would just put everything into the file system and everything would end up on tape. Uh, so that is more or less the main reason. Um, so even though it's such a large system, it's pretty stable, everything works, there are no major downtimes, uh, at least from my point of view, it's, it's a lot better than the last system. And um, so one thing that is maybe also interesting is uh, there's a client upgrade plan to version 2.7 uh, for October, uh, and that will use the Intel branch already, right? I think it's standard cluster. Standard cluster, yeah, so not the Seagate branch anymore. Server upgrade is currently not planned, um, but obviously it would be nice to get these features, but well, it's a large system. Um, so yeah, th that's also one of the reasons why it's two file systems. Um, they obviously could have built it into one file system, but then they would have needed to migrate 20 petabytes of data, and that would mean a downtime of a week or two. Okay, so the German Climate Computing Center obviously is for climate research. Um, so a bit of insight into the workflow of climate science applications. Um, they typically use CDI, which is the climate data interface, uh, which in turn often uses NetCDF, which then uses HDF, uh, which is, which could be nice because HDF supports parallel I.O. Um, so it at least would be possible to make good use of the system, but more about that in a second. Um, the scientists actually build a lot of um, application and domain specific solutions on top of that. Uh, for example, there's XIOS, which looks a lot like ADIOS in my, um, in my opinion. Uh, XML file specification and um, application specific I.O. servers that handle that. Uh, the problem is, at least in the current form, most of these applications still use serial I.O. So they ship all the data to rank zero, this one does I.O. And obviously that is not very good for performance. Um, currently a lot of work is underway to fix that, um, but at least with HDF there's, uh, there are a lot of performance problems, so if you just enable the parallel I.O. at least in these climate applications, it actually gets slower than the serial I.O. case. Um, so we're also, some people are working on that. So, uh, second part, the, the cost efficiency. Um, as I've mentioned, the cassette, the storage system is a pretty large system, um, and in the cassette case, at least, it's a very significant portion of the total cost of ownership, so it's in the range of 20%. And like I said, uh, they could not scale up the storage system as much as they wanted to, and obviously that is true also for future systems. So we can, or the climate scientists, can produce more data much faster nowadays because they get these nice uh, compute increases, uh, but it's a problem to store all this data and to store it in a fast way. And um, that's why we are currently investigating uh, compression. We've also looked at uh, different things like recomputing results, which is complicated if you change the uh, computer architecture, uh, deduplication, which needs a lot of main memory, so in the range of uh, 300 uh, terabytes or so, just for this storage system, or even more, so it's not feasible, but um, compu uh, compression is pretty nice. So the current uh, status is here on the left side. If you use Lustre with the ZFS backend, you can just enable compression in ZFS, and you at least get server-based uh, compression. And um, <coughs> that's already pretty nice, but you it's not really a Lustre feature, and it's something we're working on. Um, and the problem is, I talked about the network, at least in the DKSet case, you don't get full performance between the compute nodes and the I.O. nodes. So we would like to have at least the option of compressing the data um, already on the compute nodes, ship it in compressed form across the network, then Lustre doesn't, or the Lustre servers don't have to compress it anymore, and just store it in ZFS. So that's what works, and that's what we would like to do. And that's what we're actually working on, on in our IPCC. And um, to investigate the possibilities regarding compression algorithms and where we could actually perform compression. Uh, we've done a small study basically um, looking at the whole I.O. stack, so main memory, uh, the network, the, the servers, 
and we've looked at both the performance of compression and also the costs, because obviously it incurs CPU overhead and uh, you have to pay for that at some point. And if you have a 60 petabyte file system, you have to pay a lot for it. Maybe. Um, so typically, people say, well, we want to do HPC, so compression is slow, so we can't do that. Or scientists say, my data is not compressible, it's, um, I already do everything I can, but we found out that's not really true, as you will see on the next slide. And we've seen a few interesting things regarding cost efficiency. Uh, we still have to look at the performance impact in more detail, especially um, if we do it on the client, but there will be a separate talk tomorrow by Anna um, about that. So just a, an overview of the different um, algorithms. Uh, the most interesting ones are that I will talk about in the next few slides are as it the LZ4 family and ZSCD. Um, basically, we ran LZ bench on the climate data set. I'm not sure, a few terabytes, uh, a lot of terabytes actually. And um, we captured the average compression speed, decompression speed, and the compression ratio. And as you can see, uh, especially for the fast algorithms here, you can get in the range of gigabytes per second. Uh, these are all lossless compression algorithms, and you get a compression ratio of around 2 for said to be incompressible data. Um, so it might be worth it to still deploy this, uh, because having 100 petabytes instead of 60 still sounds nice. Um, so these results actually are suspicion suspiciously good, but we um, confirmed them, so they can really reach 3 gigabytes per second on a single core in software, uh, which is kind of amazing. Uh, ZSCD is below gigabyte per second, also has a higher compression ratio, and also pretty nice. And there are also like um, Zlib, Xzet, and so on for archiving purposes. They're much slower, but have higher compression ratios. So the first level we looked at um, is main memory, because you could compress main memory, um, at least if you use Linux, uh, as probably everyone is, uh, you can use ZRAM to uh, compress your main memory if you really want to do that. Um, we haven't really looked at it, but we, we just tried to run the numbers. So it supports LZ0 and LZ4. Uh, it can do multiple compression streams, so you can get above these three gigabytes per second. You, depending on how many cores you sacrifice for that, you can reach 10, 20 gigabytes per second compression speed. And the figure basically shows here the total cost, um, so the, amount of euros we spend just for main memory in Mistral and we've looked at a few different um, memory configurations 64 gigabytes, uh, 96 and 128 and our goal was to reach 128 gigabytes per load so in, in this case uh, we compress 60 gigabytes, we leave 4 gigabytes uncompressed as a fast uh, cache basically in this case uh, we use as much memory as we need to reach 128 with compression and re leave the rest uncompressed in the same year. And these striped um, bars are the costs which are on the left side and all the other bars are the capacity in this case on the left side. So if we do no compression, uh, we are somewhere here. So actually it, this is the more realistic configuration, 240 terabytes. Um, so if we do compression, we get something like almost 400 gigabytes without any impact on throughput, at least theoretically. As I said, we haven't looked at, more, at that in more detail, uh, but we will be. Uh, one of the reasons is, obviously, if we have made more main memory, the scientists will use it to produce more data that we have to store. So that's kind of lower on our, our priority list. Uh, what is more interesting for us is the network and the storage system. So for the network, like I said, the I.O. performance is not optimal uh, since we have this blocking. So we would like to have, or we would like to use compression to increase the network throughput. And surprisingly, that works. Um, so the same graph here, we have costs this time per node. Uh, we have here the throughput um, of a single node. And we've looked at a few different network uh, technologies, InfiniBand here, Ethernet, Unipath, and um, again, this published thing is the uncompressed throughput. Uh, Mistral uses FDR InfiniBand and that is here around um, 60 gigabytes per second. 
and since LZ4 and LZ4 fast especially are so fast, um, if you sacrifice four cores maybe, uh, you can actually get this up to 100 gigabits or 125 gigabits with ZSTD. Obviously here you need more cores, um, but you can actually improve throughput. And since the new uh, Rodwell nodes have 18 cores, you could say, I don't care. Use four cores for compression and uh, we get better I.O. performance. Um, so one thing that we noticed if you use the slower algorithms, um, they actually limit throughput, obviously. So if you have faster InfiniBand here, you see that this line stays at the same level because it, even if you use all the cores for compression, you just cannot get faster. So it's important to use the best algorithms, which are probably as it for fast in this case. Um, what you could also do if you really wanted to is uh, replace FDR InfiniBand with QDR, compress it, and you basically arrive at the same performance. Uh, but since this decreases cost by only 15%, um, it's maybe not so uh, interesting. So, the most interesting part is the storage system. Uh, so, the numbers we use here are a bit different from the actual Mistral system because we've done this sometime in the past and the numbers were not official and so on. So, what we assumed were 50 petabytes of storage with 650 gigabytes of throughput uh, since we wanted to make sure that the storage system does not get slower. Uh, like I said, approximately 20% of the costs were for the storage system, which in this case is 6 million euros. Um, we've used 60 SSU ESU pairs for our calculations, which means you get almost uh, a petabyte per pair and roughly 11 gigabytes throughput per pair. Uh, so if you use these numbers, you arrive at 100,000 euros per SSU ESU pair. Uh, we assume the base cost uh, because there are Intel processes inside, main memory and so on, of 10,000 euros and 90,000 euros just for the hard disk drives, which could be realistic. Um, if we then do compression, obviously we could use the CPUs that are already inside, but these uh, SSUs have uh, two socket, eight core CPUs, which might be overwhelmed with doing compression, so we said, okay, if we would do compression, we buy either faster CPUs or additional cores, um, for 1,500 euros just for compression, so this overhead money is already included. Um, and then we've looked at two scenarios, one is uh, we look at these uh, compression ratios uh, to figure out how many hard disk drives we need to get these 50 petabytes of storage capacity and then we only buy as many SSU, ESU pairs as we need to get this. Um, so there's one point, this is the lowest cost that we can reach because we only buy the hardware that is really, really necessary, but we also decrease throughput because, as I said, each of these pairs provides 11 gigabytes of throughput, so if we only buy half of them, uh, we have the throughput, basically. Um, then we looked at the second scenario. Uh, we purchase as many HDDs as we need, but we still buy 60 SSU, ESU pairs and uh, distribute the HDDs across them means we have higher costs because we have these 10,000 euros base cost per pair um, but we also have a higher throughput because we have all the pairs available for providing the throughput. So, uh, probably also not so easy to reach, read. Um, again, costs here, total cost for the storage system, the yellow line is the, or the original cost, uh, 6 million euros, and the blue line is the uncompressed throughput which was 650 gigabytes per second. And um, just to focus on the most interesting ones, these are LZ4 fast, LZ4, and ZSTD here. Um, again, the striped ones are the, uh, well, the blue striped one is the costs for scenario one, the yellow one is for uh, scenario two, and the fill bars are the throughput. So as you can see here, scenario one, we buy less pairs. Uh, we have costs of a bit more than three million euros, but our throughput is also half to something like 370 gigabytes per second. And obviously we do not want that. Um, so we spend a bit more money to buy these additional pairs, so the cost increases to maybe 3.7 million, uh, but we get a throughput equal to the original, so 650 gigabytes per second. The same is true for LZ4, because it basically provides the same uh, performance and, and compression ratio for ZSTD. 
Uh, this one actually had a better compression ratio, so as a 4 was below 2 and ZSCD was above 2. Um, so we can actually de decrease the costs to roughly six, uh, 3 million euros, and the throughput has actually also decreased a bit uh, to 630 gigabytes per second. Um, but of, of course, we yeah, save 3 million euros. Um, we, like I said, this already includes the extra costs for faster CPUs or additional sockets. Um, so obviously we haven't tried it in reality since uh, the system is there. We've tried it in smaller configurations. Um, so this is just server-side compression. You could already use that with ZFS. Uh, the problem currently is, uh, and we're working on that to get LZ4 fast into, um, into ZFS, because currently you can only use LZ4, um, and Zlib. So these are out of the questions, but we're working on them. So to conclude, um, DKSet has one of the largest storage systems, but it's kind of problematic to use it. Uh, that is one thing we're working on, getting the, um, the libraries in shape. And some people are also working on the applications. And what we are mostly focusing on in the research group and also in the IPCC is um, that the storage systems just lag behind. So the hardware doesn't develop as fast as the computation. Um, so we're looking into compression to make this a bit less painful at least for the time being. And um, if you're interested in our IPCC work, we have um, a web preliminary website here. We'll start to fill it with more information also on how you can try this out with the ZFS backend and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So your compression takes place inside your application code then? Uh, no. So what we want to do in the IPCC, that one doesn't work yet, is to have the Lustre client actually compress the data. So it's completely transparent for the applications. So have you, have you actually looked at that? I mean, so, so my immediate question is, is how do you handle seeks, right? You, you're not the... Yeah. Um, so uh, it gets a bit problematic, obviously, um, because you want to do compression on, on a Stripe level, maybe, and then um, you somehow have to enforce best practices to only do Stripe level accesses, because if you do a small random access, you get this read modifier write overhead due to the compression. Um, that's a problem we're working on. Um, but if the applications behave and do large accesses, there should be virtually no overhead. But like I said, the, the client stuff is in the, in the beginning. Hi, thank you. Does it depend on the, um, uh, the type of the file you take? The um, text file or... Uh, the compression ratio? Yes, yes, yes of yeah. course. Um, so we just ran this benchmark over, I don't know, the, the, the work um, partition probably. Uh, so this one includes everything like text files, netcdf files, uh, grid files that are already compressed. So it's a mix of everything and this is just the average. Um, so if the application developers actually do compression inside HDF, obviously it, you might not gain much. Um, but as it for has this nice feature of called early abort. So if the data is actually incompressible, it will just detect that and not compress it again. Um, yeah. But it heavily depends on the data. Uh, so we're actually working on getting some kind of framework or tool that you can run on your data to get a first estimate. Uh, currently, we've looked at climate data and, and uh, photon science data, and yeah, at least there's something to be gained in both cases. No more question? Ah, yes. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but have you looked at latency? Um, because the throughput is nice, but what's the cost of the actual context switch if you have dedicated curves or? About Looked at what, sorry? Um, the cost of latency. Um, ah, latency. Um, no, not, not, not really. Okay. Um, like I said, also that's more for the client, um, because on the server you mostly don't care. Yeah, I think it's um, fine for Luster, but I'm thinking at like main memory compression. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so in, in the storage case, we mostly ignore it. 
uh, but for the network especially, if you have InfiniBand, um, yeah, it's an open question. Okay. Thank you.